，我们可能会永远失去的食物功能表。Hello, everybody. I am here to welcome you to the Last Supper. This menu has been put together with ingredients that experts and models predict、uh, will not be around for our kids and our grandkids. And you'll see that it's many of the foods that we that we hold dear. Now, I started、uh, off my career as a chef, and then into policy, and now working on. Technology and innovation, trying to build some of the solutions for the future. I first came up with this menu idea、uh, in 2015 around COP21、uh, in Paris. And the the point、uh, of this menu is not to depress you.、Uh, it's not to you know make you feel bad. It's to really talk about what's at stake when we say the words climate change. What do the words climate change actually mean? What is two degrees warming? Actually, me. I'm from Chicago. Like two degrees warming, that sounds good. Like I'm like, let's warm it up a little bit. Maybe what about five? And I think we've really failed to connect what's truly at stake when we talk about the issues that we've been discussing today. So let's get into it. Let's start with those、uh, those hors d'oeuvres, those appetizers. Let's turn to fruit. Turns out that trees are really having a tough time. And this includes nuts and stone fruit like pistachios and almonds. Or peaches. Last year, we lost 95 percent of the Georgia peach crop. 95 percent. And when you start to look at the models and how our environment is changing in our lifetimes, I don't believe we'll be growing peaches in Georgia at all. Let's talk about the wheat in your bread, or the rice in your salad, or the chickpeas in one of the dishes. The core, some of the core commodities, the core staples that feed. The world in the United States, the models show that about for every one degree of warming, we'll lose about seven and a half percent yield. We'll decline about seven and a half percent year over year. That's only part of the story. The other challenge is right now on a global basis, 15 percent of the world's wheat is produced in persistent drought conditions. But if and when we hit that two degrees, 60 percent of the world's wheat will be produced. In persistent drought conditions, so not only are we going to see precipitous decline of yields over time, we're going to see much more frequent disruptions and complete collapses of harvests in certain regions. It is impossible to comprehend the economic upheaval as we start to see these core commodities decline, the food insecurity and malnutrition that will result. Of this, and the political instability of forced migration and conflict over resource, as these core foods that feed most of the world start to decline because of climate. So let's go to your main course. Let's go to salmon. Salmon are also having a really tough time. We all know their epic journeys up rivers to spawn, and those rivers are not only warming, but we're starting to see reduced flows into them. Because of reduced snowpack, and by about 2050, the models show that we will lose about half of that flow into those rivers because of reduced snowpack, making that journey for those fry back to the ocean nearly impossible. But there's also massive heat waves that are flowing through our oceans now. Those heat waves lower the oxygen levels and make the environment really unsuitable、uh, for many of these life forms. This past year, just a few weeks ago, California、uh, announced it had closed the entire commercial fishing for the whole state, the whole coast, because essentially there weren't any fish to fish. This is not some far-out future challenge. Now, I wish I could tell you, you know, you're still going to have your dessert and everything is fine, but I'm sorry, I have to come for your chocolate too. And in some ways, chocolate is faring the worst. So there's probably you've never probably had a bite of chocolate that wasn't grown within about 10 degrees of the equator by smallholder farmers. And there is not a single model that shows that if and when we hit two degrees, that any of that region will be suitable for chocolate production. It will be too dry and too hot. That means those trees are going to have to walk and move. They're not very good at that. 
And the communities that that will affect are ones that do not have the resources to weather storms of that nature. The economic and social upheaval that will come from those kind of changes is profound. And again, this year, not in 2040 or 2050, chocolate prices are up by 50% because those production ecosystems have been hammered by drought and, and extreme weather. 50% this year. Well, I'm gonna give you one more. And this is where like, I just don't even know what to do. I'm ready to do anything to solve the problem. Raise your hand if you've had a cup of coffee today or a, or a cup of tea. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I know. Let's say, how many of you had two cups? Three? Yep. Four? All right, guys, we should, we should talk because I'm a little worried about you, okay? <laughs> that's, even for me, and I'm a real coffee person, that's a little extreme. I'm not gonna ask five because then I get, you know, yeah, exactly. I can see it in your face, sir. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, coffee too. The IDB predicts that just similar to wine, if and when we hit two degrees, about half of the regions that are currently growing coffee will no longer be suitable for coffee production. About 75 of the 124 wild varieties of coffee on the verge of extinction right now. And that's really a problem because much of the genetic material that we will need to try to uh, produce hybrid varieties that could thrive in much more volatile climate are gonna be lost. But the point here is not to depress you or to scare you. It's not, <laughs> it's not. No, it's not. It's to try to make an emotional connection in a way that only food can to understand really what's at stake when we're having these conversations. And I believe what's at stake is fundamentally our way of life on planet Earth. It's our identities both as individuals and as communities and cultures. It's, it's the vibrancy of our, of our country and of, and of the world. And fundamentally, as a father of, of two young boys, age six and five, Sai and Rafa, it is fundamentally our ability to pass to the next generation uh, a better life than we were given, a life that is as rich and delicious as the one we've been lucky enough to have. That is truly at stake now. The good news is, on our plates really does hold some of the biggest both problems, but also potentials to solve these challenges of anywhere that we have. And that's the part that gives me a ton of hope. We know food is a giant driver of, of environmental and climate change damage. It's the number one driver of biodiversity loss by a lot, number one driver of deforestation and land use change, number one use of the world's dwindling fresh water, 70% of our water goes into how we feed ourselves, and it's the number two driver of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Now, unlike energy, and mobility and transportation, where we can see a future where that curve is gonna bend, food and agriculture is going straight up with absolutely no end in sight. So we must figure out how to reduce the negative impacts the system is having on our planet, full stop. The second big part of the work that we collectively have to do is around adaptation and resilience a part that we are simply entirely unprepared to deal with right now. We're now about to enter an age of extreme volatility with d dwindling resources of water and soil, higher energy prices, and we essentially are unprepared. So we need much more investment and focus on preparing a, a food system to deal with the reality that we are entering in today. But this third part is the part that gets me excited and gets me a lot of hope. Because I firmly believe, I know to be true, that food and agriculture, nature-based solutions more broadly, namely, you throw in there, oceans and forestry, are the only systems on planet Earth that has the capacity to sequester enough carbon in the time horizon, this is the important part, 110 billion metric tons of carbon that are in our atmosphere used to be in our soils. That's 80 years of our current footprint. And we are starting to see tools and technologies and rediscovering of old techniques that can take a lot of that carbon 
and put it back into the soil. And technologies that allow our food system to become much more efficient and vibrant. I'll give you a couple that uh, are super exciting to me. One is a company called Lone Bio that has discovered fungi microbes that are pulling down the coat seeds that pull down between one and three tons of carbon per acre per year and store that carbon in more permanent forms in the soil. When you do the math on how many acres are under cultivation, this is a tool that can be transformational. More company like Inari Agriculture that is using modern breeding techniques that can dramatically increase yield while reducing the amount of fertilizer that's needed or pesticides and herbicides that are needed to protect that plant. I could go on and on about these tools. They're out there. We have the solutions at hand. The problem is we're just out of time. So for all of us who are working on these issues or leading in whatever we are, doing whatever we're doing, if we have our plan and we feel comfortable, like, yeah, this feels about right, like I'm doing my thing, then we're simply not doing enough. We have to get fundamentally out of our comfort zone and take on a lot more risk in terms of our actions. So I hope that as we sit here tonight together and eat some of the challenges that we face, we understand what's truly at stake. We understand that we absolutely have the capacity to solve this challenge, but that if we don't act now, we're gonna lose time. But I know that we can look back and collectively say to ourselves, we stood up and met the moment and we ensure that our kids and that our grandkids will be able to enjoy a delicious meal like the one we're having here tonight. So thank you for your work and I look forward to seeing what we can do together. Can you like, subscribe to our channel, and learn English